Okay, so continuing our structure function kind of division here, um, you can say some things about networks that are found, neural networks, right, that are found in different great big chunks of the gray matter, right, um, in different, you know, portions of the cerebrum. Um, and again, this is, we're looking at a, a, a cerebrum here. There's a cerebellum is also attached back here on this particular brain print. But here it goes like this, right? And right at the front, right behind my forehead here is what we call, you know, the frontal lobes. And, you know, once again, the brain is symmetrical. So you have a left hemisphere and a right hemisphere, right? They go like this, right? Um, and, uh, you know, the frontal lobe is on the left side. So this portion right in here is called the frontal lobe. And then it's also on the right side, right? We're going to see that all these lobes that we're talking, these great big chunks of cortex actually are found, um, you know, in both hemispheres. So the frontal lobes, you know, the left and right are found right behind the forehead right here. Um, and they are typically associated with, you know, aspects of, you know, complex social decision making. So, um, you know, social engagement and decision making in social contexts, you know, um, is dependent often on networks that are, you know, that must develop with experience, with social experience in these frontal lobes. And I do want to point out that, you know, this is, I don't want to be overly reductionist here, like um, <laughs> the, uh, the social decision making you know, that is dependent on these networks that develop in the frontal lobe with social dis experience are actually linked, remember, by long range white matter connections to, you know, networks in other lobes that are essential also for social decision making. I mean, this is this is an, a, this is a kind of an orchestrator. It's sometimes thought of of, you know, um, other uh, uh, networks in other lobes in the brain that are involved in various aspects of perception, like visual perception or auditory perception um, or, you know, bodily visceral perception um, and, you know, the decisions that we then, you know, consider and then make. So the frontal lobe, though, I want you to think about it as being critically important for sort of social decision making. And also remember, you know, engagement of that somatic, you know, mobile activity behavior, you know, voluntary conscious behavior. Uh, any sort of motor aspect, you know, of, of complex decision making is going to involve output from the frontal lobes. Um, there's, um, you know, motor, direct sort of motor output, you know, neurons that are located in a particular gyrus here um, that actually have, there's a mapping of your body there and it, they, the, the neurons there project out, cross over and then can directly move the opposite side of your body. So um, voluntary movement, you know, social decision making, and another critical aspect of frontal lobe function, and it's in, involved with social decision making, is kind of inhibition of kind of impulsive responses. So as you develop facility, you know, um, in various social settings, you learn about, you know, ways to achieve goals and ends um, that involve sometimes inhibiting your initial response. You know, one, one example that we often use is like, let's say you're a, you know, a two-year-old where the frontal lobe is not all that well developed and there's a birthday party and, you know, you know, you're, 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 <laughs> there's cake on a low table, you know, you're going to run for that cake, right? But if, you know, you're, you're, if they're trying to wait for the cake, you know, for example, and, you know, your uncle, you know, who's, you know, in his forties or something, you know, where to suddenly go over and just start stuffing his face with cake. Well, you know, the uncle's supposed to have like a developed frontal lobe. So you would inhibit, he may, he may be hungry and want, you know, that particular, want a piece of cake, but you're not going to take it before the two-year-olds get it or before it's, you know, it's time. So you can inhibit those, you know, kind of impulsive, more impulsive responses. So the frontal lobe, very important for social decision-making, uh, for sort of biases, like the jumping to conclusions about different circumstances by, you know, for sort of deploying schema, like what are my expectations in this circumstance, this social circumstance, motor activity and um, in inhibition of inappropriate responses are all, you know, critical, you know, aspects of frontal lobe function. Then as you go beyond, you know, back here, there's another lobe here that's called the parietal lobe. 
Um, there's a great big sulcus actually that's located um, right quite centrally. Um, it's kind of hard to bring it this kind of a shiny brain. I got to find it. But like right here, there's a great big deep sulcus that goes runs down here. Uh, this is called the central sulcus. That separates the frontal lobe from what's called the parietal lobe, which is more posterior. And the parietal lobe is, there's, a, there's another gyrus there that has a map of the opposite side of the body, really important for what they call somatosensory input. So body, somato means body, remember soma is cell body. Um, but your, one half of your body is mapped in the parietal lobe on the, you know, the opposite side of the brain. Um, in terms of like what it is you're touching, your body's position, you know, sort of where is my body actually physically located? Where does it extend to? Um, and the parietal lobe also is going to receive a lot of visual information that's actually originally coming in from the eyes and originally arriving at the back of the brain. This lobe at the very back called the occipital lobe really receives lots of that information from you know, the eyes and starts initial processing of visual information, but it distributes through white matter connections, right? Through those, you know, projections into areas of the parietal lobe where it, that visual input gets integrated with the somatosensory bodily position input to sort of build up a spatial map of where my body is, right? In relationship to objects and, you know, things that are happening you know, outside and around me. So to be able to do this, right, I need to really, you know, know where this is, where my body is, right, so that I can, you know, uh, make those, you know, mapped connections uh, and know where things are basically in our environment. So we say the parietal lobe is critically important for, you know, spatially mapping aspects of our environment. It's actually really interesting when people are undergoing surgery for let's say epilepsy to remove certain portions of the brain that where the seizures are, you know, uh, generated uh, or initiating. Um, they'll often test different regions of the cortex as it's exposed to see if it's, if it interferes with some critical process. And there are some famous, you know, case studies where they would, you know, stimulate a portion of the, of an individual's parietal lobe, and they would get these odd sort of uh, out of body kind of experiences. They feel like they're kind of they were rising up and looking down at their body, for example. And when you pulled the electrode away, they would snap back into it. People who have, um, you know, uh, sort of migraine headaches that have a focus in parietal regions, you know, where there's sort of changes in blood flow that steal blood and cause dysfunction, you know, of parietal regions during the migraine, they, they can have what are called um, sort of Alice in Wonderland syndromes, where they, you know, remember Alice who eat me, drink me, where they can feel like they're getting very large and everything else is getting very small and distant, or they can feel like they're getting very small and everything else is getting, you know, kind of larger around them. They have these, you know, dramatic sort of body space, spatial distortions, actually, that can be a result of parietal lobe dysfunction. So parietal lobe really important for spatial mapping of your body and its relationship spatially with other objects and events. The occipital lobe, again, remember, really critical for visual input, a lot of visual processing. We'll be talking about that next week. Um, and then we have the temporal lobes, which are really essential for another kind of aspect of visual experience, um, recognizing what it is that you're actually looking at. And, you know, the temporal lobe is also involved, we're going to see in like other aspects of, you know, object recognition, not just purely visual. Um, but basically the, the, the areas of the temporal lobe are organized around what, like whose face is that? Is that a face? Uh, is this a brain? Uh, you know, is this a, you know, a coffee cup, you know, et cetera. So, so um, recognizing objects is a very important you know, function of the temporal lobes. Um, and then um, another critical, you know, kind of sensory function is auditory or hearing information. So input from the ears is ultimately going to work its way into, you know, maps in the temporal lobe. So there's aspects of, you know, hearing, audition, uh, and also language. Um, very important, um, you know, function also of temporal lobe regions, particularly language comprehension for both auditory input, but also sign input, um, to sort of visual input. Um, and then uh, in the middle of the temporal lobe, medial temporal lobe, 
Um, there are areas that are really involved in certain forms of memory. There's a structure in here, it's an old paleocortical region in the medial temporal lobe called the hippocampus that we'll be talking about in more detail later in the class. Um, that is um, kind of essential for certain forms of you know, episodic, remembering specific episodes or experience you know, from your life and comparing them to sort of the, the current circumstance and situation. So the temporal lobe, you know, auditory information, recognizing objects, object recognition, um, and also um, aspects of language comprehension um, and memory. And then there's another lobe. <laughs> it's kind of hidden. It's sort of deep within this lateral fissure here. Um, in fact, to sort of see it, I've got another brain. And let me be very careful with this computer so it doesn't pop out. But um, basically, here's, a, here's another brain, right? You could sort of see here. Here's the, the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, and the temporal lobe. Here's this great big deep, what's called lateral fissure. Whoops, I lost some of the cerebellum. I'm going to take the cerebellum off because it's going to cause problems. And then, like, if I open up that lateral fissure, do you see more cortex deep inside? That's actually called the insular lobe. And the insular lobe is very, very important actually for, you know, psychology, our psychology and our decision making. Um, it actually receives lots of visceral gut, enteric nervous system, you know, information, lots of afferent information gets a lot of somatosensory information, but not about, let's say, touch or, you know, position sense, um, like spatial mapping stuff like in the parietal lobe but rather like injury or itch or um, temperature, like if you're feverish or sweaty or something, um, and gut, like am I, you know, how does your body actually feel? Uh, if you ask somebody, how do you feel? You know, and they give you an honest answer, you'll see activation in that insular lobe. Um, so the insula is a really critical region for mapping the internal visceral state of the body, very important for emotional, you know, reactivity and emotional regulation, actually. And it, the insula is very heavily interconnected via white matter, you know, projections with these networks in the frontal lobe that are essential for making, you know, social decisions. So um, I want you to think about these various lobes and their functional associations, you know, frontal, parietal, temporal, uh, uh, occipital, but also the insular deep 